Hi, I'm Tamara Saviano, director of Without Getting Killed or Caught. Hi, I'm Paul Whitfield, director of Without Getting Killed or Caught and uh, husband of <laughs> Tamara Saviano. I'm proud to present the ASCAP Lifetime Achievement Award to Guy Clark for his outstanding accomplishments as a songwriter, recording artist, and musical mentor in the field of country music. Texans really love their heroes, and Guy is a true blue Texas hero. He was a powerful figure with an enormous presence. I'm pretty sure they'll say he's one of the greatest American songwriters that ever lived. Why didn't Guy Clark become a big star? I'm not sure they yet knew how to market a poet of Guy's caliber. Guy didn't care about pleasing the record label. He was passionate about the songs and he was hell-bent on doing things his way. It bombed. And I was lost, <laughs> looking for something. I'm Susanna Clark. I live in Nashville with my husband, Guy, and our best friend, Towns Van Zandt. It was a mythical love story. You had to be there to, <laughs> to get it. Guy and I were married, but Towns and I were soulmates. He knew what was most important to Susanna. Towns Van Zandt died on January 1st, 1997. Susanna surrendered something that night. She went to bed and didn't get up. I quit and started over. And all I gotta do is do it. Nobody says you can't. I continued to spiral down as Guy's star kept rising. Here I am, folk singer. <laughs> he knew what he wanted to be. That's clarity. Like this waiting for dreams. You know, I'm just cursed with artistic integrity. Lord, what a beautiful woman. His songs were literature. It just, it couldn't go on. This might be it. I never was a country singer. I'm still not a country singer. I just write songs and play them. I'm Guy Clark. That is a trailer from the documentary Without Getting Killed or Caught, and this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Today we're celebrating the life of legendary singer and songwriter Guy Clark, and a few other notables, I might add. And who better to do that than the filmmakers behind Without Getting Killed or Caught? which brings Guy's colorful life and the then burgeoning Americana music scene to life. Tamara Saviano and Paul Whitfield. Tamara was Guy's longtime publicist, is a Grammy award-winning music producer, award-winning author, and now a documentary filmmaker. Paul Whitfield is Tamara's partner in life and in crime, serving as co-director and producer, DP, and writer on the film. And in his spare time, he follows his boss, The Boss, Bruce Springsteen around with a camera. So Tamara and Paul, welcome to Factual America. Hi, Matthew. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Um, so again, the film uh, we've uh, listened or some of us have seen a trailer, those on YouTube, uh, without getting killed or caught. Uh, so was South by Southwest the premiere? Yes, South by Southwest 2021 was the premiere. It was supposed to be 2020, but we all know how that went. Um, but we were happy to be invited back in 2021, and uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I was supposed to be there in 2021, so I uh, might have run into you if, uh, if I had been, but congratulations on that. And do we have a wider release yet? We don't. We, um, we're happy that we you know, had our debut at South By, and we actually won a juried award there, which was really exciting. And we are in the process of doing six virtual screenings for the Kickstarter backers and the people that have been with the film for a long time. Mm. And then we are, you know, looking for the right distribution situation. Um, we've had offers, but none of them that we're ready to uh, settle on. Okay. Um, so it's, it, it's not wide yet and I'm not sure when it will be. Okay. Well, congratulations uh, on that. The, I'm no surprise that you got a jury award. And also, um, this is your uh, directorial debut, both of you, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, well done. And, and a personal note, as a Texan born and bred, but who's been here in the UK for way too long, uh, thanks so much for making this film. I think it was, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so I don't know, even know where to begin with this film, I have to say. Um, because, Neither did we. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think... Um, you know, uh, I one I thought once someone put else put it well. They uh, said it, uh, it re in reference to the film. Ex it explains and it teases and it celebrates and mourns in a way that should enlighten those who aren't fans and satisfy those who are. That's Steve Pond at the rap. And with that high praise and those lofty goals in mind, I think maybe that's what we'll uh, we'll try to go uh, go with. And Tamara, maybe you can. Um, uh, why don't we start with you just introducing our audience, because I have a feeling a lot of them may not know that much about uh, Guy Clark and Susanna Clark. So maybe introduce us to who, to our main, two main protagonists. There's others in this story, but let's start with those two. Well, Guy and Susanna Clark um, came to Nashville in 1971, the fall of 1971. And they came here because Guy had gotten a publishing deal. They had been in L.A., um, but they chose Nashville largely because of the success that Chris Christofferson had had here and their friend Mickey Newberry was here. Mm. So I look at Guy and Susanna as kind of that next wave of literary songwriters that came after Christofferson. Um, and once they settled here, you know, everybody started hanging out with them. It was at, you know, Jim McGuire, uh, their best friend and photographer, his studio and at Guy and Susanna's house that all these songwriters came together. And uh, Susanna called it a hippie poet salon, but it was all about playing songs for each other. And they wanted to write great songs. That was their only goal was to write great songs. Um, and it was a unique time because, you know, country music um, is really the thing in Nashville. This is largely a country music town, even though there's a lot of genres of music going on, the business surrounds mm. country music. And Guy never fit into that. And so he had to blaze his own trail. And he really is one of the, you know, founding fathers of what we now call Americana in Nashville. Mm. I mean, it's it's interesting because uh, that, that's something that caught my attention um i usually think of however you want to describe it but you know like if if you want to say one genre is outlaw country it's usually about people f fleeing nashville uh but he came to nashville and blazed a trail didn't he yes and and you know some people tried to tag guy with the with the outlaw tag and he wouldn't have it you know he said i'm not an outlaw i'm just guy clark i just you know write songs and sing them mm. and he you know he was friends with the outlaws you know with mm -hmm. waylon and willie and um you know hung out with waylon a lot and waylon's on a lot of guys early records but guy never considered himself as part of that movement um i don't think he considered himself part of any movement he was a folk singer and that's how he thought of himself and he just wanted to write his songs and play them for the people um, and I think he was, frankly, surprised by his influence on other songwriters. Happy that he had that influence, but surprised by it. And then we've also got, obviously, we have uh, Susanna as well, who's an artist in her own right, um, songwriter. Yes. Um, I didn't know about the album covers. That was quite, uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Stardust for Willie Nelson. I know one of Emmy Lou helped. Uh, Harris's, um, you know, yes. um, albums. So um, um, they're almost this power couple of this burgeoning scene, aren't they? They were. And what's interesting to me is, you know, Susanna primarily was a painter, but then she'd write these songs and they would be the ones that would become the hit songs. You know, yeah. she was the one making money at songwriting. Um, and I think, you know, the reason that we chose to have the film in Susanna's voice was because Guy and, and Towns, who's also part of our film, were such towering figures. And I think Susanna's voice, you know, got lost in the, mm. in the greater world <laughs> um, when people talk about Guy and Towns. Yeah, well, that's, I think that's a really good point, because I was going to say, we can't leave Towns Van Zant out of this discussion, can we? And uh, for those who don't know, I was trying to describe him the other day to someone here, and uh, um, uh, I... 
He's sort of the best known of the unknown singer songwriters everyone is supposed to know about. Is the way kind of I put it, and I and I have to say I wrote I I took uh, Guy's advice. If you come up with something in your head, write it down. You know, because five minutes later it's lost. So uh, I had to rethink that one. But uh, but yeah, I mean it's uh, let's say something about Towns because he's obviously plays big in this story. He does. Guy and Towns were best friends, and uh, Susanna and Towns were soulmates. And he, the three of them, were just the best of friends, and they all influenced each other's art. Um, and just spent so much time together, you know, and, and Towns was Guy's favorite songwriter and Guy looked to Towns as his yardstick. If, if Towns thought a song that Guy wrote was good, then that was good enough for Guy. And yeah, I think Towns dying early really mm. kind of fed into this myth of Towns Van Zant. Um, you know, we didn't delve into Towns' career very much in the film. Mm. He, he's in the film um, based on his relationship with Guy and Susanna. Um, but I think that, you know, his, he was a troubled soul. He probably had a lot of mental illness and he self-medicated. And I think that and his early untimely death, you know, sort of made him this folk hero. Mm. Um, but in my opinion, Guy's the better songwriter. You know, I, I mean, that's just my opinion, of course, but I think Guy really worked at it. Um, and has such a large body of work. And um, it, it seems like people fall in either the town's camp or the guy camp, and I'm rarely in the guy camp. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's uh, forewarned. Uh, but, uh, but also, I mean, if when I was looking into this and trying to remember back to my own misspent youth, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, when you look at it, uh, town's is output was really concentrated in this very short, relatively short period of time. And something I was going to, I think we'll talk about in a few minutes is just, like you say, this breadth of work and uh, sort of even from, even from a time standpoint that we had with, um, um, with, with guys uh, output, but you, you've talked about this relationship. This is this very interesting uh, triangle that existed, isn't it? That's part of, big part of this story as well. So you've got the the lovers and the married couple who are Guy and Susanna. You've got the soulmates who are Towns and Susanna. And then you've got the best friends who are Guy and Towns. That's a very interesting uh, interesting relationship. It, it is an interesting relationship. And when I was writing my book about Guy, um, you know, the book, of course, is much longer than the film. And that that relationship was so compelling to me, which is one of the reasons we focused on it in the film. And then we found, well, Guy gave me these diaries of Susanna's and the audio diaries. And Paul and I spent an entire summer after supper mm -hmm. listening to those tapes as Paul digitized them. And, you know, we, we were just like, man, we have struck gold with these tapes. And that's why we decided to, you know, write the narrative the way it is, um, really using the tapes and, and TR, Susanna's tape recorder, as, right. a, as another character in the film. Yeah, I think. Uh, and then, as you well document, I mean, the, during this period, and, and these are like, I mean, these these tapes are amazing. They're, they're basically um, having a few, <laughs> you maybe getting a little <laughs> drunk now and then, um, and just, um, I don't know, uh, talking about everything and and singing and songwriting and all kinds of stuff. It's, uh, uh, I mean, because Guy, Guy gave you these tapes in her diaries. I mean, this is uh, very personal um, stuff to open up to you. I mean, that must have been, um, was it difficult for him or how did, how did you approach that? Well, you know, Guy gave me Susanna's diaries and those tapes two days after Susanna died. And... Wow. I was over at his house because during that period of time, I was over at his house several times a week. And um, as I was leaving, he said, Tamara, there's two boxes at the door for you. And I kind of peeked in the boxes and I, and I said, well, what is this? And he said, it's Susanna's diaries and, and tapes that she used to record. And, and I looked at him and I asked him if he had read anything or listened to anything. And he said, no, but whatever's in there is Susanna's truth and you're welcome to it. Um, and, you know, we were working on the book then and Guy was very ill and 
I think, you know, at that point in his life, he knew that the only way his story was going to be left behind is if he opened himself up to me. Mm. And he did, you know, and, and I know that he really trusted me. Um, you know, I, I told, I, I could tell by the way he treated me, you know, he told me that he told everybody else that. So it, at some, at some points it did feel kind of like a heavy responsibility. Um, but at the same time, I, I knew that having those tapes of Susanna's, I, I don't know how to say it, but I, I felt like it, like, like Susanna was pulling the strings somewhere. Like she was telling guy, make sure Tamara has that stuff. And she, you know, I feel like she's been kind of pushing this along yeah, yeah. all well, along. And I guess I gather Susanna really was pull, <laughs> pulling the strings in many ways throughout their life. Was it, was it she? I think so. What do you think, Paul? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, going back to the tapes, uh, most of those tapes are is just drunken nonsense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we would sit and listen to them. Every new tape we put in, we'd think, OK, this is going to have something great. <laughs> and occasionally, yeah, we did. We did stumble upon some some really uh, uh, great bits. But there was a lot of just drunken nonsense and uh guy asking towns to play this song <laughs> play this song play this song hey town, play this song and so it's a lot of towns playing and singing and saying hey why doesn't somebody else play and sing for a little bit i've been playing this whole time yeah. so um <laughs> there's a lot of that and then occasionally there would be a, a real intimate moment so mm. there's a lot yeah. of uh, yeah. a lot of going through it all yeah and at at this time, certainly when they were uh, so he first come to Nashville, Nashville in the seventies and into the early eighties, um, guys getting signed with major record labels. But in some ways, I mean, it's an interesting because um, these albums are poorly received, or they're not even. He doesn't even let them get released. Um, was he just being uncompromising? Was he a purist, or just plain stubborn? You know, because you could say he was struggling, but in other ways, I mean, he's, his, his output, the songs he recorded and what others recorded, are, it's amazing. Yeah, I think it's a little of all of the above. I mean, he definitely was stubborn and he wanted to do things his way. And um, as someone who likes to do things her way, I can absolutely relate mm -hmm. to that. Um, but, you know, he also just wasn't cut out for the Nashville country music business and mm -hmm. And I love country music and I love Nashville. And so I'm not making any judgment call on that, but it's just a very different thing, you know, yeah. and guy really, you know, first of all, he came from Texas and Texans, uh, well, you're a Texan. I don't have to tell you, you know, Texans like to follow their own path yeah. and guy tried to do it the Nashville way. And I think he really had hoped that he would have success the Nashville way. Um, but it just didn't suit him. You know, his songs are not what I would call country radio friendly. Mm. Um, his songs are like short stories, you know, and he is a poet with a guitar. Um, you know, and I think, you know, like I talked to Joe Galante who, who ran Sony music here for many years. I talked to Joe for my book and, and, you know, guy was signed to their label and Joe said, but at the time, they didn't know. They had no idea what to do with Guy. They were all fans of Guy. They mm. all loved what Guy was doing. But as a record label, they did not know what to do with him um, because it, you know, his songs really didn't belong on country radio. Um, and that is not a slam against country radio. That yeah. is just a. They are not. A, it would be like you know putting hip hop on country radio. Just well, they do that now, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> they actually do. Yeah, That's well, right. Know, I mean, it just at the time, it just wouldn't. You know, just didn't work. So, yeah. um, I think it just took Guy a while. Well, he did five albums for mainstream country labels, and after that is when he decided that he was going to quit and start over. And when he did that, you know, he took a five year break and then he recorded old friends and he was, he yeah. was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I think, uh, yes, I can speak to the stubbornness. Uh, you can, <laughs> I think uh, he, I think there, is it in your film or did I see it elsewhere where he's receiving an award and he's like, he's been in Nashville for, I don't know how many years. And he thinks he's just about broke even now. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, 
kind That's of feel, film, yeah. feel, this, feel the same way about the UK. But uh, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, yes, uh, it defies categorization and people like, especially back, I think that someone else uh, about a different artist recently was saying that, especially back then, sort of 70s, 80s, even more so, there wasn't this crossover that you can get now so right. readily. And so you were either country or you're either whatever, folk or your yeah. you know your your pop or your then later rap and hip hop and hard rock and things like that so uh just the crossover just doesn't didn't really happen and and i think even growing up we kind of categorized our our artists that way you know yeah you went into yeah. a record store and you were looking for a record you went over to the bin that held country music or folk music or pop music or yeah. you know rock and roll and that's how everything was categorized on radio and in the record stores, you know, and certainly now with the way the business has changed, there's a lot more crossover, yeah. Yeah. but not back then. And meanwhile, Susanna, during this period, before he, you know, during this five album period with uh, the big labels, um, Susanna's doing fairly well, isn't she? You know, she's... Uh, penning number one hits and the album covers we already mentioned um i mean did that cause that caused a bit of a, a tension in their their relationship didn't it yeah you know Susanna thought that guy was resentful of her success and guy thought Susanna was too competitive so you know i think there was some tension in their marriage and you know when Susanna wrote uh come from the heart and kathy matea yeah, took that yeah. number one in 1989 you know, Susanna took her royalty money and went and got her own apartment so she wouldn't have to live with Guy anymore, <laughs> which I still find really funny. Um, you know, and as Guy says in the film, she just had enough of his bullshit. And, and you know, there was also a lot of substance abuse and craziness going on. You know, like Paul yeah. talked about, you know, listening to those tapes, you know, it, <laughs> It was kind of just crazy. It's a, a lot of liquid moments I sensed uh, in the in those years and in his in their lives, um, especially with the crowd that they were uh, hanging out with. I think. Um, and then uh, if we just bring them back into the story, weave them back in a little bit. We've got Towns, who's then, as I think already you've said, spiraling uh, a spiral of addiction, and 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 you know he's he's. In some people's estimations, penning masterpieces and uh, others are then kind of having this, uh, I don't know, lease on life in some ways in the 80s and 90s. Um, and uh, did, I mean, did Guy feel overshadowed by Towns at, as far as you know? No, he did not. He, I mean, I think there are people that tried to make that narrative, but Guy never felt overshadowed by Towns. You know, he loved Towns and he loved Towns as a songwriter, but Guy would tell you he and Towns were very different kinds of songwriters. He would not put himself in the same category with Towns. And Guy took it more seriously than Towns. And, mm. and Guy, you know, Guy, the reason Guy lived in Nashville instead of Texas is because he had a publishing deal here and he took that very seriously. He felt like he needed to be in the same town with his publisher so he could go over there, he could have mm. meetings, he wasn't on the road. And so Guy, from a business perspective, always took his writing contract really seriously. Mm. And what does town, what does Guy say in the movie, Paul, about towns never really having a contract or? Well, he, he just said he, he, ne he didn't really take it serious. He had to, uh, yeah, he was always screwing it up somehow, uh, not coming, uh, not making his turning in the songs, you know, just not taking it seriously. And uh, he, he was somebody you had to tolerate. You just had to learn to tolerate yeah, being yeah. a friend because he was hard to get along with. Well, I guess, I guess it's anyone, you know, if any of us have had any experience with people with substance abuse issues, I think that can be the real, that's a real difficult one, isn't it, as a friend? And where do you... Where do you intervene? Where you don't? What do you put up with? Um, I know you show uh, some some of that is sort of when they were doing a lot of their live stuff together. Um, I know there's some li great live albums that they've that they did, uh, but uh, you know, to be honest, often people will say, "Well, you know, th the guy's songs sound a lot better than than Towns' songs sound on those some of those albums because of what was going on." So, and not that guy didn't, you know 
partake. He, was, <laughs> yeah, he did a lot, but he took his work seriously. Yeah. And so he wouldn't show up, you know, you know, drunk or, or high yeah. at a gig. He'd wait until after the gig and then get yeah. drunk and high, you exactly. know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as you've said, I mean, um, you've already mentioned um, what, it's hard to say turns it around, but I mean, he could have stopped there. He's nearly 50. He's got a songwriting legacy. Some very famous people have re recorded his songs. Um, but he then puts out this um, Old Friends. And I think maybe we could talk a little bit more about that in this sort of second life, second career. Um, one thing you highlighted was the rise of Americana. And I must say, I hadn't actually thought of it that way before. I just always thought this kind of was there, you know. But uh, it all kind of, in fact, he's kind of the big... Um, he kind of leads the way. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and it was all very fortuitous, I think, you know, um, at the same time, you know, Guy made um, Old Friends, which came out in 89 and it was nominated for a Grammy. And, you know, he had the support of Sugar Hill and, and Barry Poss, uh, the founder of Sugar Hill, who's in our film. Um, and, and then the trade magazine, Gavin, wanted to start an Americana chart. They actually had a, you know, group of people that got together and named this genre Americana and started, you know, a new, uh, a new radio chart, which <laughs> was really bold of them to do that. And then around that chart, you know, um, radio started having specialty shows. Um, mm. Some radio stations went, you know, full-time Americana there were festivals. Um, now there were clubs. There was an organization that formed. So in that, you know, in the 1990s, it became this, you know, just this new path for people that did not fit into the country music um, umbrella, you know. Um, and it, Guy, Guy was a leader of that. Yeah. And it just so happened that it was all happening at the same time. And is Americana just really folk by another name? Or how would you... I mean, how do you describe what Americana and what makes it different from what? Because, because don't they? You, I mean, you win out. You know, a lot of times Americana artists win Grammys for folk albums, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Americana has been around more than twenty years, and I still can't tell you what it is. Yeah. Um, but it it is, you know, there is country music, there is folk music, there is some blues music, you know. And I think you know the way that I look at it is that. Americana artists typically write their own songs, play their own instrument, sing their own songs. Mm. Where in the country music business, right. songwriters are kind of separate. And then there's the, you know, singers who perform the songs that someone else writes. And right. some of the singers don't even play an instrument. So I think, you know, in Americana, if you're going to be successful, you're a fully formed artist and you sing and you write and you play. Um, and it's, you know, it's roots based music. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, defining Americana is still impossible. It's a big tent. I mean, one thing, just as a side note, I hadn't, I did not know about the Houston folk scene before <laughs> seeing this, uh, seeing this film. Um, but, and then, so one, you know, I think we're going to go for a break real quick uh, here, but, uh, one last point on there is that, uh, so Guy go, rises to this public prominence. He's getting Grammy nominated, uh, albums, um, eventually wins a Grammy much later on. But then, you know, so there's this public prominence versus what's happening in his, his personal life, which was quite, um, quite challenging to say the least, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, at that time, Guy and Susanna were living apart until 1995. Towns, of course, was spiraling and Guy felt, you know, responsible for Towns. Um, you know, yeah, there was a lot going on. And I think some of the way that guy dealt with it was he just went out on the road and played, you know, <laughs> and just worked. So Susanna was basically bedridden for 15 years. I mean, what did, I guess he, he had people looking after her when he would go out on the road, obviously. I mean, there's that. Yeah. After Towns died, Towns died in January 1st, 1997. And after that guy, you know, Susanna always had a caretaker yeah. um, at home with her. And yeah, she, you know, she, she left the house on a rare occasion, you know, she, you know, mm. surprised people and would show up somewhere, but for the most part, 
she didn't, she became agoraphobic and she just really didn't leave the house for 15 years. And it's, you know, I must say, it's kind of one of these hard ones that's hard to jibe with the, you know, these, these pictures of them in their youth. And she's this very attractive, vivacious, outgoing woman. And then to hear that, you know, that's the last 15, I think it's Rodney Crow who says she chose to die slowly or some, something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. She's uh, going to have a lot of grief in her life. You know, first her sister's suicide yeah. and then gowns and yeah. Okay. Well, we are going to take a break uh, for our listeners, and we'll be right back with Tamara Saviano and Paul Whitfield, directors and producers of Without Getting Killed or Caught. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with the directors and producers, Paul Whitfield and Tamara Saviano. Without Getting Killed or Caught is the film, premiered at South by Southwest. I think there's some screenings that are going to be had, and be on the lookout for when this is released. I hope it's pretty soon. I imagine it will be. What was the secret to Guy's greatness, or should I ask this a different way? What makes the great ones great? I mean, uh... Tamara, you've worked with Chris Christopherson. Paul, you've worked with uh, Bruce Springsteen. Um, I mean, what what is it that the these great the great ones have? Do you think? I don't know. I guess if if people knew, they could bottle it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. It's uh, they're interesting. Yeah. And I think they cut their own paths too. You know, like certainly the people you've mentioned, Bruce and Chris and Guy, they all have you know, chosen the exact careers they wanted to have. Yeah. Um, and they do, you know, they follow their heart as far as, as what kind of career they're going to have. Um, but I also think, you know, and um, I don't know Bruce, but I've been trapped in a hallway with him a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but I know Chris and Guy, and I think what I can say confidently about all three of them is they do have that undefinable it factor, you know, that, Mm. Um, they have a real presence in the room. And I remember that about Johnny Cash too. Like when Johnny Cash walked mm. into a room, he just had this presence about him that was bigger than anything else in the room. And Guy certainly had that. So does Chris. And I think Bruce has that as well. And I don't think it's, it's, it, it has nothing to do with who they are as far as they're not, you know, n none of those guys are, um, egomaniacs or anything mm. like that you know in fact you know chris and guy who you know are quite humble um and you know grounded S but i just think it's something about them and maybe it's that maybe that it's that they are so good at what they do yet they remain so grounded and humble and and regular people that that's attracts people to them no it's 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 interesting because like you say i mean i very um well, I, I didn't know Guy uh, Clark that well, but I mean, I, I mean, in terms of my own knowledge of, of music, but uh, uh, it is interesting, and they are, and they also have the longevity, don't they? Uh, that uh, that seems to co go along with this as as well. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, Tamara, if uh, as as we uh, before we maybe talk a little bit more about how you got this film made, um, the. Um, if people want to get to know Guy's music, what do you think the best way it is, besides watching your film, obviously, or listening to your Grammy award-winning uh, tribute album? I mean, if uh, if people want to try to access or really get to know Guy Clark's stuff, what, what, what would you suggest? I would suggest they start with Old Number One and Dublin Blues, those two albums, and um, go from there. I think if, if anybody takes the time to listen to those two albums and they like what they hear, then they can go down the Guy Clark rabbit hole. But um, I mean, not to say those are the best albums. They right. might be. I mean, I can't choose a favorite, but those two albums will really give them a taste of who Guy is. And Old Number One is his first album. Dublin Blues was 1995. So it's two different points in his career. Mm. Um, both fabulous records. Yeah. Well, and I, I would say even if uh, you, having done it myself, uh, you can just search for them on Spotify or one of these places and just all kinds of, because it's interesting because some people have said, oh, his, you know, his earlier stuff is more 
I mean, even Rodney Kraut, I think, talks about it. Uh, it's a bit more more produced, and he had a different sound. But I, I found it interesting just the same songs, how he sang them and played them differently at different points in his his career. Some of his iconic stuff, like like Dublin Blues, and and uh, uh, some of the ones off that uh, old Number One record. Um, well. I thank you so much for that sort of whirlwind tour of uh, Guy Clark's uh, life. Um, getting this film made must have been a real labor of love. I get the feeling because it's uh, a long journey to getting here, hasn't it been? Well, there was some uh, some speed bumps along the way. A lot happened between when we started and when we finally finished it. So, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, we took a whole summer off after guy passed away just to sort of figure things out mm. and uh yeah we took the rest of that year off really because was the because you wrote the so you did the biography right so that yeah. came out in uh 2016 2016 a few months after guy died okay and had you already had a documentary in the works or did that come after he he died well, we knew we were going to do a documentary before he died, but we didn't know what it was going to be. Um, so really, Paul just, you know, got all the gear together and we would go over to Guy's house and interview him. And we were just interviewing him about whatever we could think to interview him about, not knowing what our story was going to be. Right. Um, so really, uh, my co-writer, Bart Nags, he and I wrote the script in the winter of 2017. Mm. after that is really when the story started coming together. So from, you know, spring 2017 and we finished it, we finished our audio mixing in January of 2020. Wow. So those three years were really primarily the years. So, so that's interesting. You just, you knew you, you, so you'd written the biography, you'd won guys trust. Um, and then, and then that was extremely well received that biography. And I know you have a another um, um, sort of best-selling book that you did previously. Um, um, and then, but you knew, you're, but you just kind of just dove in. You knew th that's the way to approach it. Just uh, let's get him on on camera, and let's just start asking him questions, and then we'll we'll take it, see how it how it rolls from there. Well, we we had discussed what type of documentaries we liked. Yeah. And what we wanted the style of the film to be. And we knew we wanted to uh, we had to get him on camera while, you know, he because his his health wasn't the best. Yeah. yeah. And so we just would go to his house and get him on camera. But after probably the first day of interviewing him on interviewing him on camera, I realized that we weren't going to be able to make the movie that we yeah. had thought we were going to because uh there was just, you know, his health wasn't that good. And there was a lot of cigarette smoking and coffee slurping and cherry eating and, and everything that was going on was like, he didn't even care that yeah. we were there with yeah. the camera. So, um, we just sort of said, okay, well, let's rethink this and, mm. and see how we're going to approach it. We went around and around with the idea of whether, we wanted to have a narrator or not, because ultimately we thought we didn't want to have a narrator. Who would it be? Would it just be, would it be somebody or would it just be a voice? And then we decided, well, we have to have a narrator to really move the story forward the way to tell the story we wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. We needed a narrator. So, but we just kept going back and forth about that. We it never felt right until uh, we got the idea of making Susanna the narrator and then it all just clicked and it seemed like, uh, an obvious choice why we hadn't thought of that sooner, but, uh, because we had been trying to find ways to get, to make Susanna more, uh, of a figure in the, mm. the movie. We hadn't, she wasn't going to be that uh, prominent in the, in our original uh concept but as we were trying to find a way to work her in more then when it was like oh make her the narrator that's when it all uh came together for us well i was going to ask you about that because i mean the thing that struck me and i've i've watched had the pleasure of watching a decent number of music docs in the last year or so and uh and just docs in general you guys 
I think, used all the tools in the Doc Filmmaker's toolbox for this one. I mean, you, uh, we've got reconstructions, not cheesy, uh, archival footage, we've got diaries, still imagery, animation, and then you've talked about the narration and telling it from uh, Susanna's voice. And that obviously leads to the question of how did you get uh, Sissy Spacek to do this? That, that was That's brilliant. Yeah, well, again, I talked about how Susanna Clark was pulling the strings, and um, <laughs> this was definitely one of those. Um, we actually were going to use Susanna's niece, Sherry Talley, as mm. our narrator. Um, Sherry it has a beautiful voice, and she has a um, broadcast background. We took her in the studio, and she did a great job, and so that was our plan. Because we had we had her voice some uh, before we knew Susanna was going to be the narrator. We had Sherry voice some uh, excerpts from the written uh, journals and diaries that we were going to incorporate into the film. So we had her voice those sections. And then when we thought, OK, well, we'll make uh, Susanna the narrator. We thought we would just continue with uh, Sherry in that uh Role. Yeah. And then just out of nowhere, um, Paul and I were having breakfast one morning and all of a sudden I just yelled out, Sissy Spacek is Susanna. And Paul was like, what are you talking about? And I said, like, Sissy Spacek needs to be Susanna. I just know this. It should, has to be Sissy Spacek. And of course, Paul just thought I was crazy and didn't know why I had this sudden, you know, urge mm. to go after Sissy Spacek. And so I read Sissy's uh, bi autobiography, uh, you know, pretty much immediately after that. And in that book, I learned that Sissy grew up 100 miles away from Susanna in East Texas. And um, when, when Sissy won an Oscar for Coal Miner's Daughter, she, after that, she came to Nashville to record an album. And Rodney Crowell produced that album, oh, wow. which I didn't know, you know. Yeah. So then I called Rodney and Rodney said, Tamara, not only did I produce that album on Sissy, she recorded a Susanna Clark song on that album. <laughs> and I was like, you've got to be kidding me, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I got in touch with Sissy's manager and at the same time, Rodney texted her to tell her that I was doing that. And, um, you know, Sissy through her manager, you know, said, Hey, if I, if I like your rough cut, I'd be glad to do it. So we worked on our cut and, yeah. Um, we, we brought another actor in um, to, you know, voice it so we could kind of show Sissy what we were looking for. And um, yeah, she said yes. So <laughs> it was great. It worked out. And then when Paul, when we got out of the studio and Paul came back to lay Sissy's voice into our mm -hmm. film, it was just so perfect. Wow. That's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing story. Um, cause I'd also seen that she'd gotten started off as a singer too, before she even went into to acting. She was kind of in the folk scene, I, I think. She was. And this, the story gets even weirder from there. So the day that we uh, were in the studio with Sissy, she told us this story about, you know, how she started out as a folk singer. And when she was growing up in Quitman, Texas, her best friend had a cousin that was a folk singer in Houston. And that cousin came oh, no. through, came through town, and taught Sissy this certain guitar picking technique. And we later learned that 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 girl was Susan Spa, who was Guy's first wife. <laughs> I was gonna say, that is a, as they say, it's a small world, isn't it? Um, that is that's absolutely amazing. I mean, you were saying one thing else you said you were like you thought about your you know the documentaries you liked and you know when you were thinking about how to tell this story what were there any particular documentaries that kind of influenced you or inspired you when when uh trying to put this all together you really like that oasis i like the the way oasis the uh supersonic yeah i like that one and the uh, bang the burt burns story mm -hmm. i like that one and uh mr dynamite the oh yeah james, james brown, brown. Yeah. yeah those three were probably ones that we looked at as you know for production value or techniques or storytelling but and, and we bounced the idea off of other people 
to see which ones they like. But we found that there was a difference between men and women who liked what. You know, the, the men seemed to like one style of documentary and and the women would hate that movie. So, um, yeah, because I, I like the James Brown documentary and I thought the Burt Burns was interesting, mm-hmm. you know, but I wouldn't say that I'm a and the Oasis one is the least of my favorites. So I was just like, OK, well, we're definitely not on the same page. And I think it's because and I can't even think of the ones that I that I really liked, but. Um, I was, it was really important to me to tell the story of the relationship, that mm. it wasn't just about the music, that the relationship was in there. And, and so I do think that that's a, you know, more of a woman point of view. Um, and, and I really pushed for that, you know, my, my, um, my co-writer is a man and my co-producer and co-director mm. is a man and my husband, and, you know, and I found myself often pulling both of them back into the relationship part. Um, yeah, I kept lobbying for more facts, more <laughs> hard facts. <laughs> no, no stereotypes, no stereotypes here. But yes, I know I've, I've, this is something I've heard bef- previously, too. I mean, I we, wanted more emotions and yeah. relationship. And so, we, yeah, the emotion was really important to me. And Paul asked me once, he said, well, what how do you want the audience to react? You know, when they're leaving the theater, what do you want them to think? And I said, I want them all to be crying. And he just kind of rolled his eyes at me. And I was like, well, that's what I want, you know? Yeah, yeah that's funny. Uh, we had someone, actually someone who's, uh, you would have been our first Grammy Award winning on, uh, winner on this show, if except uh, you got beaten to that by a couple of weeks by someone else, uh, Emmett Malloy, who's done the... Uh, a Biggie Smalls uh, doc, but uh, he was saying something interesting. He was saying that uh, Netflix basically kind of has this rubric that uh, they don't want people watching a doc to then turn and check out Wikipedia immediately afterwards. And I, I find that's almost to me that strikes me that's of the male fact school, uh, mm. fact checking school of, of filmmaking. Yeah. Um, but since you didn't have Netflix on board, how did you manage to raise 182k on Kickstarter? That's impressive. I, guys, fans are devoted, man. They are devoted, and and you know we knew that the music licensing was going to be really expensive. Yeah. Um, I worked in the music business for 30 years, so I was like, we have to raise some money for music licensing, or we can't even do this. Mm. And so I thought the music licensing might be, you know, a hundred grand or upwards. And it certainly is um, that I think it ended up being about 180 grand for the music licensing. But um, so I thought, well, if we can raise $75,000 on Kickstarter, that will kind of make me feel like we have some ground to, to stand on. And we blew past that $75,000 in three days and uh, ended up with 180, you know, and then after Kickstarter takes their piece, I think it was 160 that we ended up with, but um, it, you know, it ended up almost covering all of our music licensing Mm. um, and it enabled us to start the production really. Right. Um, So, yeah, that was, if, if we hadn't been successful on Kickstarter, we never would have done this film. Yeah. Um, no, I thought I've it, and you can still check out the Kickstarter page. It's still live. It's uh, I think it's a very. Uh, um, I was talking to some people about it earlier. I mean, it's a very uh, very personal and compelling story. I think that also probably helped. You know, that helps resonate with with people who are who are keen or you know eager to to contribute to something like this. Um, and it also led to, you know, I would just encourage other filmmakers to do crowdfunding. It also led to us getting our other uh, investors. Right. Um, one of our That's Kickstarter backers became an investor and one of our investors found the Kickstarter after it had expired and then he brought in someone else. So, you know, it, it, it really helped to, you know, raise the awareness level that we were making the film and attract the right people. That's very interesting. Um, well, I think we are actually um, about to come to the end of our time together, unfortunately. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, do you have any plans? I mean, after all this, do you have any plans for any more docs now that you've gotten your feet wet? Not me. Paul might want to, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to try to hire her as a producer on 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 something and maybe she'll agree to work 
<laughs> and a lot of paperwork. Oh, uh, no. No, you know, it's interesting. I never had any dreams about being a filmmaker. I, we did this film because Sky wanted to do this film and he wanted to work with us. Mm. Um, Paul's background uh, is, you know, more film based. Um, I'll probably write more books, but I don't know that I'll do another film. Okay. Maybe if someone dumps millions of dollars in our lap, then I might do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that always, I guess that, that helps. But I mean, I guess what you would, but. You know, I, I think what others have said, and I, I gather you would agree. I mean, because um, I would say you're really, I mean, you're really good at it. You should consider doing an, another one. Uh, but it, it is down to um, the love of the subject, isn't it? And having a, you know, a passion for the project, uh, I imagine, in order to stick through it year in and year out. Yeah, I mean, I would have quit this project. I tried to quit a few times and um, Paul wouldn't let me. <laughs> um, yeah, if it wasn't if it wasn't guy, there's I don't think I would have made it, you know. And and I think you know if if I ever made another film, you know, it would be because we actually had the resources to hire people because mm. we made this film, the two of us, and we hired people as we needed them. But we really did all the heavy lifting, you know. I mean, the amount of admin that I've done is just staggering to me. So, you know, it would have to be where we can, we could hire a real, <laughs> mm. a real staff of people, you know, so we didn't have to do, you know, 12 jobs each. Um, and it probably wouldn't be about music just because of the music licensing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, and so what so, is, what is next for the two of you? Um, well, we're working on, you know, getting this, figuring out what to do with this film. And then, um, I imagine Springsteen will go out in 2022. So Paul will probably go back on the road. Hopefully. Yeah. If, uh, if the music industry starts back up again. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do next mm. and that's okay right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was almost expecting you to say, well, right after this, we're just going to open up a bottle of wine, but, uh, yeah. you know, I think, uh, I mean, uh, just quickly, Paul, do you see, are there signs that things are opening up for 2022? Are you they lining things up uh, for tours and things like that? Well, there's, there's nothing concrete yet. There's just signs of activity, though. You know, people yeah. out there in the Internet, in the, in the world, talking about uh, rumors of things happening. Right. And that people are, are inquiring and but nothing actually uh on the books yet that i'm aware of you know people talking about it thinking about it saying it's going to happen yeah. but nothing actually uh booked yet i think the insurance companies are still trying to figure out oh gosh how much yeah. they want to control everything so we just have to wait and see what happens how quickly i always forget about the insurance people but uh yeah. any, anyway well thank you Thank you so much. If you do ever decide to do another doc, um, we'd love to have you on if we haven't scared you off. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. That's nice of you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Uh, I just want to thank Tamara Saviano and Paul Whitfield for Without Getting Killed or Caught. It's premiered at South by Southwest. And be on the lookout for its uh, hopefully imminent release. So just want to say thanks again to Tamara Saviano and Paul Whitfield, the uh, directors and producers behind uh, Without Getting Killed or Caught. And um, if you have any questions regarding how you can become documentary directors and producers like Tamara or Paul or other roles in the industry, I recommend you check out careersinfilm.com to learn more about careers in the film industry. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our engineer, Freddie Besbrode, and the rest of the team at This Is Distorted Studios here in Leeds, England. As always, a big thanks to Nevin Apaunovich, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting such guests like Tamara and Paul onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. 
This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.